paper is a best paper award, and it's being pre presented by Sheena Arete. I hope I Arete. Your surname correctly. Sorry about that. It's fancy. Accent, Arete. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to jump into it. So currently in the U.S., there's been an increase in the in the number of citizens participating in local governance. And local governments, sometimes also known as participatory governance, is the conversation between residents and city officials to inform local policies, such as how city officials should handle the distribution of city funds, or how the police should establish relationships with the community, or how the mayor's office should handle issues of police brutality. So while there have been a number of studies on in-person engagement and participatory um, in participatory governance, one of the largest studies was by Arkong Fong from Harvard, where he aimed to understand participatory governance in Chicago, um, where the goal was to create a functional democracy in which community members influenced the actions of local government officials. So for years, Fong actually observed Chicago residents who participated in these monthly meetings with city officials and the police to influence change, and he found two things. Essentially, he found that meetings were accessible to everyone and that meeting structures supported citizen-led deliberation and decentralized decision-making. So thus, he concluded that there existed empowered participation happening in these settings. So in addition to in-person studies, HCI scholars have been growingly uh, interested in uh, growing, growingly interested in understanding the role of digital democracy in participatory governance, including de designing tools for local civic engagement. However, many of these studies do not address institutional inequalities embedded in the social, economic, and political infrastructures that impact community uh, issues such as crime. So many of these inequalities are actually perpetuated by local policies, which are mostly shaped by groups of who with political power. So what is political power? It's the ability of a collective group of citizens to influence local policies. And research has shown that the economic status of a group actually impacts political power. And the poor have traditionally not had much political power to change policies that directly affect them. So our goal in this was to understand the role of ICTs, that, the role that ICTs play in citizen engagement and participatory governance. So does ICTs, do ICTs actually uh, continue to empower citizens, particularly in these settings? And we define ICTs as these tools that support interaction with many citizens that are relatively easy to access, things such as web forums, email lists, social uh, media websites. And we focus on crime because one, it's a prominent issue in Chicago, you may have heard. And, uh, the t and two, the topic allows us to compare our results with that of Fong's earlier work. So this was a part of a three-year ethnographic study in Chicago where we focused on three neighborhoods or communities in Chicago. So the first thing we did was select the communities um, that we were going to study using the governance rules of crime, which are defined by the police. So here's a map of Chicago. And the police divides the city into 23 districts. Now they've restructured into 22. But each district is controlled by a police commander. And that commander essentially makes all the decisions about what's happening and how that area is going to be policed. And each district is broken down into six to 10 beats. So a beat is a relatively small geographical area of roughly 20 square blocks where a set of police officers are assigned to police. Um, and it contains about 10,000 residents, sometimes fewer depending on the population density of that area. So in Chicago, there's a total of 279 beats. And for the purpose of defining a community, we define one beat as a community. So to select the communities, we use purposive sampling, where we selected three different beats based on crime rate and race. And we selected these two metrics because research shows that citizens' attitudes towards civic participation are affected by the amount of crime and social disorder that they experience on a daily basis, and also because crime rates and racial composition are co-founded with socioeconomic statuses in Chicago in particular. So again, this study took place over three years. And during the first year, we focused on relationship building with residents and local stakeholders, creating legitimacy and obtaining the permissions that we needed to observe uh, these community meetings and building tools that we needed to collect the online data. And we also learned more about the history of each local alderman. 
So Alderman is an elected city council uh, member charged in a particular area to govern a particular area. So we used a triangulated method where we observed 48 community police meetings, various automatic meetings, uh, community events over two years, resulting in over 300 pages of ethnographic uh, field notes. We also conducted semi-structured interviews with 27 residents recruited at community police meetings online and by word of mouth. And lastly, we conducted a, a qualitative content analysis, which is where we created Python scripts to scrape 7,000 messages from the most prominent websites that were most often mentioned and used by community members. So we collected this online data from April 2004 to June 2013 from private email list servers, community forums, Yahoo groups, Google groups, and tools like Every Black. Every place you could think of that people talked online, we, we, we stalked them. Okay. And along with two undergraduate research assistants, we inductively coded the data using 145 uh, final codes with 13 higher level categories. And then we begin to compare the themes across the different communities to understand the similarities and differences across the three communities. So we found three major themes across all the communities. First, we found that all three communities used ICTs to heighten the visibility of the community's concerns. So the major differences were how the ICTs were, but the major differences were how they were being used. So community one, the most affluent community, they used uh, group web forms to successfully share their concerns and have online discussions amongst themselves about the response or lack thereof from the aldermen on the police. And then community two, on the other hand, while they successfully were able to leverage their political uh, power by having the community leader send out information about the community's concern on an on anonymous email group. So much of community two's success was attributed to the leader's use of uh, ICTs to gain visibility about the community's concerns. And then community three, the, the least affluent community, they use ICT similar to community two, meaning they use an anonymous email list, but in rare instances when the alderman or commander took action, it was typically the result of leveraging relationships with powerful officials that are outside of the community and the use of anonymity in the email list themselves. So essentially, the alderman was worried because she didn't know how many people were on the list or who was on the list. So our results also suggested that uh, all of the communities used community-based ICTs to increase the pressure on the police and city officials to take action by making their responses, whether their actions are, again, inactions, more accessible to citizens and decision makers. So in community one and community three, they typically did this by uh, sharing agendas and meeting uh, minutes about what happened in the in-person meetings. Community two mainly did this by sending out messages about police responses in order to hold them accountable to what they stated that they were gonna do, verb their verbal commitments uh, during their in-person meetings. And then during the interviews, all the residents identified barriers uh, to why they attended or could not attend in-person meetings. Things ranging from jobs to health care, transportation, parenting, uh, responsibilities. And, but they all found that ICTs were an opportunity for them to still engage in participatory governance. So communities one and two used ICTs to mainly organize an additional meetings outside of the city-sponsored meetings. So these typically were positive present walks or block club parties or just to get, uh, get together and talk about next steps. Communities two and three used ICTs to supplement in-person meetings mainly. And most of those conversations were about what was happening in the in-person meetings and the next steps. So. Despite the similarities in how technology was used in participatory governance, there were inequities in the response from city officials. So, for example, Community One, the most affluent community, had high attendance from the aldermen and the police commander. And there were at least eight incidences that we recorded where the aldermen responded directly to the email list um, to respond to individuals who posted messages. And she addressed community concerns voiced in the discussion board in her weekly email newsletter to the entire community. The commander mainly responded during the in-person uh, community police meetings. 
In community two, the alderman never attended a community police meeting, but sent representatives and the commander attended less than a third. Now, one of the things that's interesting is the commander for community one and community two were the, was the same person. So that tells you something about the differences. The, the alderman and the police sergeant were, and the sergeant, not the commander, were somewhat responsive to emails. And in community three, the alderman never attended a, a in-person meeting, but sent a representative to about a third of the meetings. And the, com the police commander attended one meeting during our two years of observations. There were only two times during the three years that we worked in community three did the alderman's office clearly respond to a community's concerns that was shared online. And that was after the uh, representative for the state's attorney's office became involved in a certain issue around a community concern. So what does this mean? Really it means ICTs can help citizens voice their concerns, but less affluent neighborhoods still have problems affecting change due to the lack of social relationships and political capital inherent in more wealthy communities. So those complex underlying issues, um, such as the impact of race, class, and power on public policy and local governance are still prominent despite the use of technology. So empowered, not really, at least not equitably empowered. However, as HCI designers or technology designers, we can use the experiences of those who have been traditionally marginalized to inform ICT design for local governance. So this requires us to design tools that attempt to sh shift the notions of power by moving beyond simply supporting information sharing and communication, but to improve equity in local governance and action for disenfranchised communities. And this requires designing ICTs that not only support relationship building amongst residents, but those that help citizens understand the local hierarchy and build relationships by considering non-traditional approaches to power. So for example, few people know that the state's representative and senators actually have the ability to, to impact the decisions of the local aldermen. So helping residents identify and build relationships with potential advocates in the unofficial city, regional, and state uh, power structure may be unconventional, but necessary to persuade local officials to address the community's concerns. We can also consider ways to design ICTs that more greatly expose local action and inaction by officials. So we can observe, we observe citizens attempting to hold officials accountable, but this was mostly shared amongst themselves. We imagine civic tools that allow residents to not only record decisions that were made in the meetings, but also to share them um, in a more public format to increase the amount of pressure that local politicians feel from their constituents. And last, we, de we design ICTs that inform citizens of the optimal times um, when there's an in-person attendance will have the greatest opportunity to enact change. Such technologies, for example, could alert citizens when it's essential to be physically present at a meeting versus signing a petition to show support, which could be of particular importance um, given where there's an overwhelming amount of competing responsibilities um, like second jobs or childcare that lower income residents have to negotiate. So technology could provide an understanding of this sometimes murky political process and to more effectively impact change by helping residents decipher when it's essential to participate in person and when it's not. So to summarize, Chicago residents appropriated ICTs to share information, to heighten visibility about their concerns, to hold government officials accountable, and to provide opportunities uh, for varied uh, methods of participation. And while theoretically these strategies increase communication and improve the likelihood of attention from local officials, the effectiveness of using ICTs is a source of inequality, not necessarily empowerment. However, as designers, we have this opportunity to create civic, to create civic technologies with the greater ecological um, implications and historical context in mind to address some of the inequalities faced by marginalized communities. One of our current projects, for example, is where we're leading an effort to work with the city of Chicago and lower income 
residents to provide equitable voice in the city's plan to become a smart city. And so this is just one example of how we as designers and HCI scholars can begin to advocate and design civic technologies for those who have traditionally had less power and voice in local governance. And so after thanking my wonderful participants for allowing me to come into their communities and tell their stories and my collaborators and funders, I'll open up the floor for questions. Thank you. Present you with the best paper award. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. That was a fabulous talk. Um, I'm Connor Kelly from the U University of Washington. Um, I, want, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how people that are in maybe uh, lower resources um, were actually able to engage with the ICT uh, solutions, right? So um, I studied grassroots, how they adapt its um, various solutions. So mm -hmm. I didn't come with a prescribed method of, of them using uh, technologies. And they right. used, what was interesting is that even the lower resource communities, it was very comparable in more affluent communities and how they use the technology, what they discussed online, how they discussed it, very similar. All of it was very similar. The only big difference was the responses from the city officials. Fascinating. Thank you. 